Hi, thank you for joining us today for Relink's webinar in Deflection 101. We're going to give people just a minute to log on, and then we're going to go ahead and start. Great, we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to tell you a little bit about Relink.org and what we do. So Relink.org is an online database. It's free to use and free to be listed on. We have over 15,000 resources in the state of Ohio, and we have them in several different categories, which today we're going to be looking at addiction recovery, and that's one of the categories that you can click on in relink.org. When you are searching for something and you go to relink.org, you simply just put in a city or a zip code or county, and once you hit those, then you'll have those different categories of care that will come up. Once you select a category of care, you'll have different options that you can browse. And we always say that you can get to a resource in three clicks in 30 seconds. Today in our Deflection 101 webinar, they'll be talking a little bit about quick response teams. And after my boss, Barbara, and I were at a great conference, Deflection Conference, um, just a few weeks ago, we came back and put all the quick response teams into relink.org. And you can access those by going to addiction recovery and then clicking on peer and other support services. And then you'll have an option that comes up for addiction recovery community groups and coalitions. And those are all listed in there. So I just wanted to tell you that we added those into relink.org. One other thing that we're really pushing this year is for people to have accurate information in relink.org. So we want to make sure that when somebody clicks on relink.org and they're getting resources, that they're getting the correct information for the phone number, hours of operation, contact person, because if they aren't getting that information, it can be defeating or they can lose a little bit of hope if they're looking for resources and it isn't correct. So one thing I wanted to point out is when you go to relink.org, this is the landing page that you land on. And on the very top right, there is where you can click provider login, sign up. And if you click on that, that's going to give you the option to put in your name, your email address. And when you send that to us, that's setting you up to be able to edit your own data for your provider information. We don't do anything with that information. We don't sell any email addresses. The only reason that we have that is so that you can edit your own data. But it's as simple as that to be connected to your provider page and to go in and be able to make changes. We're always happy to help with that too. Don't ever feel like it, you're tasked with doing that alone. You can always contact us at info at relink.org and we're happy to help with anything that you need edit wise or if you're trying to get connected as someone to change the data. One thing that I wanted to say is today there is one social work CEU offered for this webinar. So when at the end of the webinar, a survey will come up when you fill that out, then we know that one of the questions says you need a CEU for today, we'll be happy to send those and we'll be getting those out next week. And my last slide is just to show the information at relink.org. So we'd love to follow for you to follow us on social media. If you'd like our newsletters, we always put in the newsletters the next month's webinar, and we put a recording of the previous month along with other updated events and information that are coming up in the state of Ohio, things that we're working on, data and trends, we put all of that in our newsletter. So if you write us at info at relink.org, we'd be happy to get you signed up for the newsletter. So I'm going to turn it over to Ashley and Dan now. They're going to introduce themselves and do the presentation. Thank you so much for coming and sharing today. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. 
I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, so we would like to thank you all for joining us today to introduce you to deflection and the many pathways that there are associated with deflection. Um, myself and Dan will be talking with you about some of the work that's um, been happening, some of the history to this. So we hope that you gain something from this conversation. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop those in the chat. We'll try to answer them along the way or at the end. Um, so uh, to introduce myself, my name is Ashley Morgan. I am the director of the Substance Use Deflection Initiative within the Criminal Justice Coordinating Center of Excellence at NEOMED. Um, so I've been in the field since 2005. Um, previous to coming on to NEOMED, I served as the intervention facilitator in Jefferson County for the Healing Community Study. And my role in doing that was to help the community um, identify and implement evidence-based practices around opioid overdose education, naloxone distribution, medication for opioid use disorder, and safer prescribing. And prior to that, I've worked in direct service and leadership roles um, at various levels of care. So residential levels of care, intensive outpatient, outpatient. Um, and I've also served as a substance use specialist at Kent State University and Ohio University. Um, I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor with a supervising designation and licensed independent chemical dependency counselor. And I've been trained as a peer um, recovery support specialist uh, supervisor. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dan Malloy, so that he can introduce himself. Thanks, Ashley. You can probably read all the stuff on the on the left side or the right side, depending on how you're looking at the screen. Uh, my background is in public safety, law enforcement for the majority. Um, I spent uh, probably five years over fire and EMS, as well as law enforcement in the role as director of public safety. And then I retired in that city manager role um, with an opportunity to really concern myself and worry and participate with my community on how do we think differently and how do we respond differently. And that is what this is all about. This you can hear terms today like deflection and pre-rest diversion and pathways. 10 years ago, those, those terms weren't in the world that we're in now. They weren't part of our conversations. So when you hear terms like QRT, you know, referred to in Ohio, there was the DART initiative out of Toledo. So we didn't have a map to think about how we were doing the work. We were just doing the work. So, um, the ability for a quick response team was just a collaboration within our community and how we figure out how do we serve together. So we're excited to be here with you today and we hope that this is beneficial. We're gonna kind of talk a lot about what's happening, what's happened in the world in this conversation over the last you know, seven, eight years nationally, and then talk about what's happening in Ohio. So we appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys today. You're going to hear that I just said deflection pathways, two terms that we didn't talk about 10 years ago uh, that really came into light about 2017 when folks from all different disciplines came together and said, we need to understand the work and we need to provide them with definitions and direction. And so that's where we came from. It really, for us as law enforcement, the direction was we cannot arrest our way out of the problem. And I think you'll hear that. And if you're in communities across Ohio, those are the things that the leaders are talking about. The work that was done 10 years ago, it just wasn't solving the problem. It wasn't building collaboration and reducing the harm associated with addiction and the crisis we were in. Next slide. This is something you, you may remember. If not, this is just an interesting commercial that was around about 25 years ago, which you... There's no question that our best, strongest pain medicines are the opioids, but these are the same drugs that have a reputation for causing addiction and other terrible things. Now, in fact, the rate of addiction amongst pain patients who are treated by doctors is much less than 1%. They don't wear out, they go on working, they do not have serious medical side effects. And so these drugs, which I repeat, are our best, strongest pain medications, should be used much more than they are for patients in pain. 
if we take a look back and we think about where we were in 98, 2000, 2001, 2003, um, that was what the message was. And that's what our communities were responding to. And that's what we were listening to. They were the doctors. And that's what this whole conversation is about. I mean, but this slide is really powerful and it meant a lot to our work that someone with the credibility of a CDC health scientist with a doctor's label said, you know what? Coordinating services is key. Effective, this was the quote, according effective synchronized programs to prevent drug overdoses will require a coordination of law enforcement, first responders, mental health, substance use providers, public health agencies and community partners. And that was a quote from back in 2015. And it, offered some of us in the first responder world trying to build an understanding with other partners that we want to work with you. We want you to help us. We want you to educate us as well as partner with us to figure out how we can better serve our communities. This comment has always been a strong one for me because it offered us a position of standing within the folks that really never worked with us before, or we never worked with them before. So we appreciate Appreciate the comment from Dr. Seth, because this is about all of this, this whole conversation, deflection pathways is about collaboration. And that's where the power of this work is. It's around listening and paying attention to each other and doing what's best for our community as a collective. So for Ohio, collaboration is paramount. Um, the efforts in Ohio around deflection have in some ways been a model for other deflection work across the nation. Um, and from a state perspective and in um, local perspectives, there's been energy around trying to identify a hub for all of this work being done, which is where the substance use deflection initiative comes into play. Collaborat collaboration is a main emphasis of the initiative. Um, and this is a startup. It's the first of its kind in the nation. Um, we Our startup was funded through American Rescue Plan funding through the Ohio Department of Public Safety's Office of Criminal Justice Services. And from the very beginning, collaboration has been key in exploring, um, setting up this initiative to support deflection work in the pathways. We collaborated with the Ohio Deflection Association with CIT coordinators across the state, with the University of Cincinnati and Talbert House, really the people that have been doing the work for a while um, who can guide us in our mission. We currently have partnerships with Cordata Healthcare Innovations and with Dan's organization, Operation to Save Lives and QRT National. Um, this initiative is designed to establish coordinating center of excellence functions for deflection work, for quick response teams, for these initiatives in Ohio. Um, and there's been a tremendous amount of work around deflection happening in Ohio, and that's because our first responders have been, they've really been on the front line of this overdose epidemic from the very beginning. And so they have taken it upon themselves, they 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 have taken the initiative to be innovative in their approach to solutions to change lives and save lives. Um, as a result, we've seen lots of different things pop up ar around the state. There's a lot of different models and programs which and pathways. Dan's going to talk about the pathways. Um, but as Ohio started to take a step back and really look at how to best support this work and sustain this work, it became really evident that there was a need for a central repository for all of this, for the coordination of the collaboration from everything that was happening around Ohio, for the information gathering, the training and technical assistance, um, that double-sided tape, if you will, to make sure that good work and meaningful support were being connected and coordinated, that we were all collaborating, that everybody was at the table, everybody was aware of what work was happening, um, that we could build on one another's work, have that synergy. Um, and so Neomed was approached for that. We have been doing um, similar work like this for a long time. The Department of Psychiatry at Neomed is home to three coordinating centers of excellence. So we have the Criminal Justice Coordinating Center of Excellence, which is where the deflection initiative is housed. We also have best practices in schizophrenia treatment um, or the BEST Center, and then the Ohio Program for Campus Safety and Mental Health. 
Um, and the common thread across all three of these centers is really serving as that double-sided tape um, between good work in the community. So coordinating that collaboration, providing training and technical assistance, tools and resources, consultation and advocacy, really ensuring that um, evidence-based practices come to fruition in Ohio communities so that people with serious mental illness have access to effective treatment. A secondary thread that's that's emerging or has been emerging for a while is around um, co-occurring disorders and substance use. And so the Criminal Justice Coordinating Center of Excellence has really been focused on deflection work with first responders and people with mental illness for over 20 years with CIT in Ohio. So it made sense um, and the substance use deflection work dovetailed into what we were already doing. This conversation around deflection has a national focus around what happened in Gloucester, Mass. Uh, 2015, June of 2015, you can see from the, this is the Facebook post that the Gloucester Chief, Chief of Police put out, posted amongst this community on this, in the social media community, said, if you need help, come. We will, we're, our doors are open, we're a 24-7 operation, come on in. Um, it set off a storm, a firestorm of activity and conversations that just were not in place before. And if you ask the chief, and I had later on, he was not prepared for what was about to happen to him. Um, and we usually like when we're in, we're in a room together, we'll ask, does anybody know where the first person that walked through the doors of that Gloucester Police Department was from? And it wasn't from Gloucester, Mass. It was actually from the state of California. Got on a plane, saw the Facebook post, got on a plane, flew to Massachusetts, made the drive, walked in the police department, said, will you help me? And that was that's a powerful story in itself about access and fairness of, of treatment and how do we engage people. And those are the conversations that took by firestorm. And what was happening in Ohio at the same time wasn't as national, but what happened in Ohio was in up in Lucas County. What was happening in Southwest Ohio was there were these operations, there was these collaborations that were taking place. There just was no, there wasn't a Facebook post. I mean, there was a, just a, a figure out how to work. We, we were doing what we believed was necessary. We were working in partnership with our communities and trying to figure out how best to respond because the reality is something had to be done and that something looks different in every community. So whether you're Gloucester, Mass, or you're Ohio, or you're wherever, this problem presented itself and law enforcement, thank you, Ashley, said, we are a part of this. We should be part of these conversations. We represent community, we're available. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 days within our communities. We're seeing folks, we're engaging with folks and families. We have an opportunity to provide assistance. We just don't know what that assistance looks like. So this conversation around deflection was really kickstarted in 2015 in Gloucester, Mass. And it uh, it's powerful, powerful work that's happened ever since. Next slide. This conversation around deflection, diversion. Diversion has a lot of different terminologies, pre- pre-arrest booking, pre-booking, all that stuff. Deflection and diversion, you can read the slides and I think there's a question in there. The slides, are they available? We're certainly available. If, if you'd like them, we're certainly willing to share with anyone in the webinar. Deflection is the opportunity to work in partnership with our community. So when we engage someone, whether it be law enforcement or fire and EMS as that frontline first responder, and we recognize there's a need, we have a partner in the community that we can connect with rather than, as previously said, arrest our way out. Because for a long time, the court system was, at least it was in my community, it was a it was an opportunity to, well, the courts will have the relationships, the courts know the services available, the courts have that connection. They'll make sure that this person gets the help they need. But the reality is we want to avoid, deflection is avoiding the criminal justice system, the justice system. We're partnering with our communities and our partners and our agencies and our organizations that have services and capabilities that can make this situation better for this individual, this family. So deflection is deflecting away from the justice system. Diversion is once there are charges, 
it's often referred to, we hear in Ohio has a very strong drug court system. So there is an arrest. The system allows for a deference, completion of treatment, completion of the program, then the charges will be held. Those kind of pieces are absolutely a part of it. It is a combination and a partnership, but the flexion is moving people away from the justice system. And problem solving is absolutely a, a definition within law enforcement. It is a operating philosophy that's been in place since the late 80s, early 90s that says if a community has identified two or more incidents that are similar in nature, where there's an expectation that the police department will do something about it, that's a problem. We'll get, do we not agree that this crisis that we're in defines problem 150%? There were two of everything that you could think of associated with opioid use, alcohol use, substance use in general, whatever that may be, there were two more of too many that said, we have a problem and what does that drive? It drives collaboration. It drives meeting with other entities, working with other partners, being at the table, listening, asking questions, trying to figure out how we work together. That is the drive associated with deflection because I need my partners within our community to give the services to the folks that may need it. And that is absolutely what we're talking about when we talk about deflection. So next slide. This is just a little bit more formal definition regarding jail booking. Deflection, do we avoid it? Yes. Diversion, sometimes, it depends. Is a formal rest citation? Deflection, no. Diversion, yes. So you can see the warm handoff to community provider, the completion of a court program, the legal consequences, the prior arrest history makes you ineligible for future opportunities of the program. In deflection, no. Sometimes within diversion, there are criteria in place. People, the, the biggest piece that I've noticed from not just Ohio, but across the country is deflection is about the individual. It has a people-focused purpose and how can we help you today is oftentimes, there's a little more to the script than that, but the reality is how can I help you today? Is it, do you need a meal? Do you need a warm blanket? Do you need a coat? Do you need, what do you need to make you feel better today to help us build a relationship that we can work in the best interest of you moving forward? Next slide. This is just kind of an overview of the, of the pathways. I know I said there's six, but we added in an additional one because there's work happening around expanding on the growth and opportunity that happens when we collaborate. But you see the self-referral officer safe station, first responder referral process, the active outreach, meaning we're not waiting for an incident to occur. We're not waiting for an overdose. We're saying there are people in need in my community. Let's actively outreach to them. Let's engage them and let them know that we're here. Let them know that their service is available. And then there is the post-overdose outreach initiative, meaning there's been an overdose. We need to get out. We want to connect with them. We want to connect with their family. We want to make sure that they're aware of the services and the capabilities within our community to give you the help that you need. The officer intervention, that pre-arrest diversion piece, that there were, we've been called to an incident. Maybe it's a shoplifting. Maybe that's a, this offers us an opportunity to say, you know what, there's a situation. We want to connect you. Are you willing to? Yes, we can. Let's do this. The co-response model is oftentimes it's community-based. It's There's not a partner in that proverbial front seat that is law enforcement or fire and EMS. It is community-focused. Maybe it's peer-led. Maybe it's public health-led. It just depends on the community. And then there's community responder. And every community, the biggest thing that you see across the Ohio and you see across the country is every community is different. And there's a change in mindset and a change in attitude you may start with one of the pathways, but then you recognize that, you know what, we can we can engage here. We can engage with active outreach. We can allow our folks in our community to walk in the door. You've seen that advancement of not just the police departments like Gloucester, but you've seen fire stations. They're now safe stations across the country. So there's that relationship with EMS that says it's a welcome place, it's a safe place. So I can knock on that door 365, 24 seven and say, hey, I need help. My father needs help. My brother needs help. My sister needs help. Whatever that conversation could be, we have an opportunity to provide the assistance and the help within that. And the last one is 
called the situation table, meaning that as we build, we've seen communities build good relationships. And when those relationships are present, the ask from the community members is often more, hey, you helped me with the situation. Can you help me with this other situation? So it's it's multiple risk factors. It's not just substance use. It might be domestic violence. It might be employment. It might be food. It might be, it could be anything that says, I need help. How do we come together as a community and expand our service capability to respond to situations of individuals or situations involving families? And then we work on a situation by situation basis. So we're not a team that works every day focusing on this thing. We're on a we work in response to what's been presented to us from acutely elevated risk situations within our community. So it's it's evolving and our teams are growing because they're built on collaboration and they're seeing opportunities to say, you know what? We're being asked to do more, but we want to do more. Let's expand our table. Let's expand our collaborations and be able to help in more situations because our communities are asking. So this is what's happening within the pathways across the country. This is the national model. So as you can see with the way that Dan is kind of talking through how this kind of evolves and changes and fluctuates, we had five pathways, then six, um, we're having a conversation about a seventh pathway. And so it just is ever changing. Um, and we want to really help to capture that picture lay the foundation, create some solid building blocks um, to support people doing the work around deflection and quick response. And we wanna work with partners um, and stakeholders to help with that as well. So with the Substance Use Deflection Initiative, our goal is to promote best practices around all of the pathways. We want to do that by disseminating information from what we're learning from people in the field, the ways that they are intervening that we're seeing to be effective, and how be a centralized place for resources for deflection in Ohio. We um, are providing access to data support and training. So, oops, sorry. <laughs> we wanna increase the utilization of um, data support systems. And that's where our partnership with Cordata comes in so that teams or programs can capture the work that they're doing um, across any of the pathways that they're using. We're building learning environments, which we've been doing with CIT across Ohio for a, for a while now. Um, and with the deflection initiative, you'll be seeing that with the deflection echo that we've started. Um, we want to, to centralize reporting and accountability and planning efforts um, by boosting evaluation of work and outcomes reporting. And the purpose of that is really so that teams can share out the outcomes of, of what the work they're, they're doing is. Um, we want to make sure that their voice is heard on a larger scale, that they can demonstrate the impact of the work. And that really helps with advocacy around like needed resources and sustainability long term. Um, we want to help identify strategies that will increase the number of communities using harm reduction and healthcare organizations that are referring to quick response teams and deflection programs to really find the gap and um, the innovative ways that we can expand the work, um, learning how to help communities implement the pathways um, in, their, in their spaces. And across all of this, we want to ensure that the people that are doing the work in the field are part of the conversation, that they're helping with the dis influencing, the decision making at every step of the way. We really serve the people doing the work, and we want to ensure that their voices are amplified. So if you're thinking about how defl or where deflection fits, um, Dan was talking about the difference between deflection and diversion. We know that people with substance use disorder and mental health disorders are tend to be overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Um, and those settings were never intended to be treatment settings. Um, they were not intended to take care of people in that way, and they just don't have the optimal capacity or the capacity to do that optimally. Um, what ends up happening is we overburden and burn out staff in those settings. Um, people have their treatment interrupted as a result of being involved, and a lot of times um, we see worsening symptoms. 
we know that one of the highest risk times for overdose is when people are released from incarceration, released from jail. Um, so in working with SAMHSA's National Gain Center, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Center of Excellence developed this conceptual model to approach the overrepresentation of people with substance use disorder and mental health um, disorder in the criminal justice setting. So this model outlines sort of sequentially places that people can be intercepted in order to keep them out of the criminal justice system or keep them from going further into it. And over time, as systems grow and mature, it's expected that people will get intercepted earlier, um, which will lead to fewer people in the criminal justice system. So as we grow we and learn, we respond better and we shift people to get the care that they need. Initially, we were looking at intercepts one through five. So intercept one is that law enforcement and emergency services component. Intercept two is initial detention, initial court hearings. Three is that jails and court space. Um, four is reentry from prison, jail, or hospitals. Um, and intercept five is that community um, support, community correction space. But with deflection, um, we add in intercept zero, which is where those community-based services are happening. And these programs and pathways that Dan and I are talking about today are really focusing on the intercept zero and one. We want to catch people before they enter the system. Um, again, with the idea being that as systems mature, they can intercept people earlier. We want to deflect them um, away from the criminal justice system into treatment. And in taking that a bit further, we want to, we're starting to imagine negative intercept one. Can we imagine that? Can we think about intervening before the crisis? Um, how can we be intentional and proactive and targeted in our responses? How can we use our collective knowledge and experience, um, our collaborations, the relationships that there are in the community um, and data-driven decisions to really make a further impact? Um, how can we grow in that area? And deflection initiatives have really evolved. These pathways have adapted to be inclusive of more than one pathway, sometimes all the pathways. We, when we work with teams, it's really rare for us to see a team that's just focused on one pathway. It usually kind of spills over into a variety of things. Um, and the deflection initiatives have expanded partnerships, that collaboration has expanded, um, and teams and programs are led by a diverse group of, of people. We know teams that are led by law enforcement that co-respond with peer supporters, um, teams that are led by fire and EMS that are co-responding with law enforcement and people with lived experience, programs that are um, health department led or social work and peer support led. Um, regardless of the way that the teams are led or how they're made up, the success is really in breaking down the silos and that collaboration and that coming together of bringing public safety and public health and treatment systems, all the community stakeholders together to address the social health needs within the communities. And Ashley talked about it when she was talking about learning over time and growing over time, just to give you some numbers. Since we started really drilling down and trying to better use the data, you heard the conversation, data-driven decision-making, better understand what our actions lead to. In the state of Ohio, since we started collecting information relative to deflection and the work of the teams, there have been over 34,659 referrals. That was between September of 2017 and November of 2023. There were over 93,000 interactions, meaning that we're not just waiting for a referral. We're not just engaging with individuals and family members once. We're engaging with people multiple times over a myriad of time and circumstances. So it, as she said, it's not just one way of doing business. There's a lot of opportunities for engagement, and we're taking those chances and, and working that way. Over 20,000 27,000 referrals, either to treatment or to services, meaning we learned very early on that success isn't just identified by connection to treatment. It's identified with 
building and trusting incredible relationships identified by what do you need today? How can I keep you safe today? Is it that food? Is it that warm blanket? Is it a place to sleep tonight? What is it that I can do for you right now to help you understand that we are working in your best interest? Those are the things as we build trust and credible relationships we had to learn about. So it's not just a bridge to treatment. It's a bridge to how can we help you? So those are the things that we've learned over time. We're better understanding what stage one or stage two of this disease looks like because we have been responding for years at stage four, responding to the overdose, responding to the crises. What if we could better understand and have a negative intercept opportunity, be there beforehand, the, the community education, the engagement, the opportunity to build a relationship. So, you know what, I'm struggling. How can we help before there is a real need? But specifically, these are some examples of how the pathways are working in the field. Now, I will say with the caveat, you're going to see titles on these slides that are really under consideration right now. We were just in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago talking about the pathways. Specifically, we're talking about the third pathway that is the Naloxone Plus, that quick response team, that community collaborative response, and saying, do we need to change the name? Do we need to understand? Because the conversation that the field is driving is we are engaging with people and they're in circumstances and situations that are more than just substance use. There's a combination of such circumstances that are presented to us that we have to be responsive to. So the conversation in DC left, we need to understand and listen to the field and be aware that mental health is in these conversations. Mental health is what our teams are responding to and they're being asked to provide connection to and resource to. Do we redefine or reestablish what we're doing today versus what these conversations look like in 2017 when we were still trying to figure this out? The field is driving the conversation. The field is driving, yes, we need to look at this. We need to be a little more open to not, is it just substance use? There's so much more that's being asked of teams when they're in a community and they build that trusted relationship. There's a coming back to the team to saying, hey, you helped me. Can you get can you help me find a, a primary care doctor? I'm not feeling well, but I don't want to just walk in anywhere because I have a, a story to tell. And I don't know if they're going to treat me like you guys treated me. Is it is it it just it's grown and it's very powerful, but it's it's what building that relationship has proven to be. So what I'm going to do is over the next few slides, just kind of give you some examples of what's happening around the country. We talked about the ANGEL initiative. We talked about walk the walk-in program. That's the original Gloucester model. It's often a first step for law enforcement and public safety because it doesn't require the assignment of any real personnel to anything other than training the folks that accept the visitors at the front door or answer the phone to say, to listen and be responsive and utilize my partnerships within the community to say we can get you connected. That's the angel piece. There's an angel here for you to provide that connection and services so we can get you the help that you that you request. So that is where the angel initiative comes from. That's the terminology for the angel. But oftentimes it is the first lift because it doesn't require me as, to, as a leader to assign anyone to a new job responsibility or to give them to somebody else so they're not doing the other work. The terms hope not handcuffs, that's out of Michigan, uh, the Families Against Narcotics. That organization has been around for about 10 years. They've grown quick response teams and other work around deflection across the state of Michigan. So hope not handcuffs is recognizing that how can we provide assistance without engaging them in the, in the justice system? New York is another hope not handcuff community. Maryland was this first safe station, that fire station being there, and then Kentucky State Police has a huge angel initiative that's happening across their state. The first responder referral means first responders assist in the deflection during calls for service and everyday activities, meaning there's, hey, how would you would you like help? Do you need anything? Can we get you connected with the services? Really? Can you do that? Absolutely. We have partners now. We have friends that are raising their hands. We have partners that are standing in that second and third ring that are waiting for us to call. And they, like I always say, they come with coffee, they come with food, and they often always come with a smile saying, how can I help you? That's not something that we as public safety and law enforcement especially are used to. 
when they're saying, hey, can I be helpful to you? Absolutely. So again, next slide, please, Ashley. The incident-based post-overdose response, that again, as I shared, the Lucas County, Ohio DART initiative, the Arlington Mass Outreach, that's Chief Fred Ryan said, why are we waiting for incidents to happen? Let's figure out and who's in need. Let's go out there and do this. And then Colerain, the Kentucky Court, QRTs, the Plymouth County, Massachusetts, their Plymouth County outreach. The unique part about them is Plymouth County is made up of 27 communities and 27 different police agencies. And in that county, every single police chief signed on to say, we will work together. So if someone overdoses in my community, we will help. We'll help each other. That's That doesn't happen. I wish it did. I wish we could say that. But to have every chief in, a, in, a, in one county saying we're all on board, whatever we need to do to make it work, that's happening. And it's, so it's and then the Boston, so it's not just small towns, it's not just big cities, it's anyone and everyone. It absolutely works. To to Ashley's example, the core teams in Kentucky, we have a hospital led team in one community. You have a peer led team. You have a public health led team in a large city in the state. So it really is about what the community needs to build collaboration and who's going to engage in the outreach. It can be anyone and everyone. That is the coolest part about working collaboratively. It's about your community. It's not about a round peg and a square hole. It's, it's about how can we work together? And again, I share the active outreach, the incident, the opportunity to say what is in need here and how can we pre be proactive in this help? So next slide. And this is the table you kind of kind of talked about it. It's the weekly collaborative. We're recording the risk factors. We're learning the barriers. We're learning the partners. The biggest thing about this is, is the risk factor, the recognition within a community that these are the high, the most identified risk. We have a community in one state. They are surprised, and I no one on this webinar will be surprised, but they were surprised by the identified risk within their table was trauma. But it pushed out and it just ever presented itself. So trauma was the number one risk factor in this community. And they had had natural disaster. They had had flooding. They had had a lot of things happen in their community that were driving need, but it presented to the community leaders like, oh my gosh, trauma is real. Trauma is real in our community. So we have to think differently. We have to partner differently. How do we give services to our community when trauma is that number one risk factor? And you can see the, the rest of the slide, but it's really interesting to learn because the data is driving, to Ashley's point, the decision-making, So, it's, but it's not just qualitative, it's quantitative saying this is what is happening in our community. So it's really... Wish it didn't happen, but the reality is it's telling a story that allows us to be more responsive to the needs of a particular community and how can we make sure that they're getting the service and the partnerships needed to serve their community. Next slide. And then officer intervention and community responder model. The officer intervention is that charge is held in the bench. You know what? I'm going to hold this charge for this shoplifting case and I'm going to allow you to go to treatment and see what happened. I'm going to, I'm not going to put this in the system. So I'm going to make sure that I'm going to hold this back, you know, and one of my officers, a young officer, I thought again, it was talk about a different opportunity to demonstrate changing culture and changing mindset. I said, chief, what if we don't, we just hold those and, and we let them, let them come in and shred it, let them shred all the paperwork. Wouldn't that feel good if you could just let them watch their charges being shredded away because they completed something. I'm like, again, go back 10 years, go back eight years and how much we were trying to learn. I took that as we're winning hearts. I used to talk about winning hearts and minds, trying to win hearts and minds every day, change attitudes, change mindset within our community, as well as within our organization. As a young officer, I thought that's we're we're, we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere wasn't formal, but it was something that allowed us to see change and, and say, you know, and reward them for their uh, for their success. And then the community responder model, you've heard of the CAHOOTS system out of Eugene, Oregon. That's been in place since the early 90s. Community responder model, the Denver support team, the STAR initiative, deploying mobile health, behavioral health professionals, again, civilian-led crisis response that says, how can we be helpful today? How do we need to work this? The, the biggest piece, is, think Ashley said is the collaboration, the partnerships, not 
having silos or creating silos is bringing everyone together to talk about what is most important in our community. How can I help you? How can I work in partnership with you? How can you work in partnership with us? So we're not letting anybody slide through the caps. We're allowing, trying to fill the gaps with the right partnerships and the right teams and the right resources. Next slide. And we all, my partners and I, I work in partnership with, with two chiefs out of Boston. We met during COVID and we all started with this conversation is we started with the opioid crisis, but what we learned about was a larger need, larger scope of people and families and individuals that say, you know what, there's so much happening in the world. There's so much that's going on within our world. Again, it's not just substance use disorders, not just opioid or alcohol use disorder. And that oftentimes, and when we gather together, is we're often reminded that alcohol still presents itself as that number one, number one on all the lists, right? We're still working with alcohol. And we were just in another community a couple of weeks ago because of the fear of xylazine, because of the impact of fentanyl, the community was telling us that they're seeing a significant increase in alcohol use because there's a fear associated with the drugs having xylazine or being laced with the fentanyl. There's a lot of fear. And again, it's a community conversation, but that's the first time we had heard that, that we're seeing increased alcohol use because of the fear associated with the xylazine. Family members, family members, loved one resources and support. We cannot forget that there are family members, there are loved ones associated with this individual. How are we serving them? How are we connecting them? How are we listening to them? Do they close the door and pull down the blinds because they're they're just afraid? They don't want it. They don't know who to talk to. They don't want to talk to anybody because they're going to be looked differently. People are going to roll their eyes at them. What do we provide to them? How can we give them the connection to service? How can we let them know that they're not alone? powerful, powerful tool that's happening within this deflection world and these relationships happening within the communities. Drug exposed children, the witnessing of traumatic incidents. You heard from the situation table, the, the risks identified within a community said trauma is the number one risk presenting. Mental health disorders, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, violence in communities, young people, at risk adult populations, these are all the things that are now part of the conversations that maybe weren't part of the conversation 10 years ago. We're allowing ourselves because of our partnerships to sit in a room, talk about what's important and listen to each other to say, you know what, I'm not the expert in this, but I'm here to help you. Ashley, go ahead and take over because this is your area of expertise. Just let me know how I can be helpful to you. That's the changing dynamic that's happening within law enforcement, fire and EMS, public health, public safety, community relationships. That's what's happening when we talk about what's the impact long-term on, on this conversation around deflection. We're listening and working together more so than we ever did before. Next slide. So to round out to, to our time today, I just wanna share a little bit about what we're focused on right now um, to support deflection work in Ohio. Um, and I think one of the things that I hear from Dan over and over and over, um, the importance of that collaboration, the relationship of being able to pick up the phone and call the person um, to make that connection immediately, um, just how important those that community building is. Um, so we've talked about building learning environments or learning communities. That's what we're trying to do with this deflection echo. Um, so this is a virtual learning community. It really provides a health facing response to substance use um, that engages, deflects, and it supports strong community partnerships. So this collaborative focuses on bringing justice systems and treatment systems and first responders all together for a supportive community outcome, evidence-based solutions to substance use crises. So the format of this is that um, on the second Wednesday of every month from three to four, if you'd like to join us, um, we have 15 minutes of an educational didactic presentation. And then 45 minutes is set aside for consultation among participants. So people can bring um, scenarios or cases from their work in the field with deflection or quick response. They can ask questions um, and they're, colleagues or peers in that are able to um, offer suggestions, solutions, share their experience with um, their own work with this kind of thing. Um, they can offer support and connections. 
And the idea is that this is an all teach, all learn model. Um, we're all kind of doing this together and we're lucky to have Dan as our facilitator. He's made it a real priority to connect us and to build a culture of collaboration. So he really continues to model that within the Deflection Echo. Um, the QR code links you to registration if you're interested in um, signing up for the Echo. This link is also going to be, it'll be in the slides that you'll have access to if you want to learn more about the Echo. But Dan, did you want to add to the conversation about the Echo? No, I, I'll be honest with you. Um, it's We spent a year working on building the Echo in this, in this world of deflection, and it's really cool. I mean, I, I just want to share that it's, it's kind of a powerful tool. It's fun being in the room, working collectively, because what I think we saw a map last week or something that it's not just, a, there's folks from all over the country that are signed in and joining on the deflection. So we get to, we get to learn from each other that all teach, all learn thing is, is real. So we get to bring in the experience from all over the country. So when we have a situation presented, it's not just, Ohio centric, it's team centric, it's the work centric, it's deflection centric around, you know, my experiences were this and that. So um, it's, I didn't know what to expect going in, but I can't say that I'm disappointed because it's, it's one of the best, it's the best meeting, one of the best meetings I have every month is gathering together with these folks and just being for, being there for each other because everyone's at a different stage of their creation or implementation or operations of their work. That is the one thing that's happening is, you know, we've got some old time teams, but we also have folks that are just starting now. So everyone's thinking from a different lens or looking through a different lens. That is to be helpful to each other. If we can speed up that timeline so you don't have to battle through. It took me 20 months to move from operate to, from idea to operation. It's October 13 to July of 15 to make it happen because of all the things that happen in community. If we can reduce that by six, eight, 10, 12 months, guess what? We're serving people. People are better served because we're reducing the timelines. That's the goal of this echo is we can give folks the resources and the help. They're not fighting the battles that we had to fight at the beginning. They're getting it up. They're getting it running because that's all driving human engagement. It's about people. So sorry, Ashley, I got a little, got a little long winded there. No, I appreciate you. Um, Rachel, I saw that you turned your camera on. Do you need to gatekeep us for anything? I think we're still good on time. If you still have any more comments or anything else to add, I was just going to read um, one of the comments in the chat. It says, I absolutely love this model. I work in the anti-human trafficking movement, and this is such a great precedence for a solidified response to multiple populations. Thank you for the work that you do. Awesome. Thank you. Well, this is my last slide and then we can take questions. Um, our focus or our goal right now is just to continue to build the initiative to continue to support the work. Um, we're currently doing a QRT inventory project where we've invited all active QRT teams um, to have a conversation with us so that we can really start to understand, get a baseline for how teams operate, how they're led, how they function, um, who they're partnering with, how they're funded, because it looks wildly different all across the state. And that's gonna inform how we continue to support and do the work um, moving forward. Uh, teams are continuing to get access to data support through our partnership with Cordata. We have started a deflection email, which is how um, it's a distribution list. We're going to disseminate a lot of that evidence-based practice information or promising practice information out as we start to learn it. Um, but also that's the space for, um, we're going to be putting out events, funding opportunities, um, news about programs and teams around Ohio. Again, this link is in the slides, You can, uh, which you'll get after this if you're interested in signing up. And then we have a website. It is just launching, so it's relatively new, but we hope to put resources, literature, um, events, et cetera, up on the website. So um, we just really want to thank you for your time today, um, and we really appreciate your interest in being here. Um, Dan, do you have anything? No, it's always an honor to be with, with folks and 
that have a passion for service. And that is something that um, gives me, gets me up every day. So, you know, working with our communities and, and giving service back to those in need. I mean, this is, this is the good stuff. So we greatly appreciate everybody being with us today. And, and if you have questions, I mean, certainly reach out to Rachel if you forgot the email, but it should, our emails are in there. So if you need something from Ashley or myself, just holler at us. I mean, we meet on a monthly basis every, that second Wednesday of the month as Ohio. We meet from 1 to 2 p.m. every month talking about what's happening in this world of deflection across Ohio. It's something that we just, it's a, it's a powerful learning community. And um, we've been doing it now for five years. And we've grown from zero participants to, I think we have over 400 invitees to our monthly meeting. And Rachel's going to be with us in April, on April 10th to share Relink and the work that you're doing. So again, we're always growing and always trying to learn. So again, that all teach, all learn, that learning environment, we are, we're all in this thing together and it's, it kind of invigorates you. So it's nice to know that there's cooperation and partnerships happening. And as we build the deflection initiative, we're hiring. I just popped a link in the chat. Um, we're hiring for a program coordinator. So if you're interested or know anybody in your network, please share. Does anybody have any questions in the last couple minutes? There are so many nice, encouraging comments in there in the chat. That was really nice. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I don't think I see any more questions, but if you have any and you want to pass them on to me, I'd be happy to pass them on to Dan or Ashley. And once we get those slides, I always send a follow-up email out the next day. So I will send that email out and you'll have a copy of those slides. I'll also attach the survey again. It should pop up at the end of the webinar. Sometimes it, it doesn't work the way it's supposed to, but I will send that out if you need to see you and I'll be getting that to you next week. But I just appreciate you both so much for your time. This was excellent. I learned information today and I appreciate all the work that you're doing. It's really great work for our community. Thank you. Thanks for inviting Thanks. us. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye, everyone.